Hi, my name is Renato and today I would like to talk to you about serverless databases and almost all about relational databases going serverless. What is good about them? What um, might be not so good about them? And the main challenge you have to face when you decide to change your approach and use a serverless relational database. Before going through the details and see what is available and what is not available and what works and what doesn't work, I'd like to start with a bit of convention. What do we mean by a serverless database? That's the very first point. Well, first of all, let's make it very clear. Serverless is very different from just being a function. Of course, if you have been used to play with um, Lambda in AWS or anything that is function-based, you tend to, to associate the idea that serverless is just a function. Well, serverless is much more than a function. And if you think just about a function, well, then there's no much sense to think about a database, a data layer. And uh, when you think about more, you think mainly about serverless as an on-demand scaling and price point. What do we mean by that? And um, let's try to make it quite clear what are the main points that we need to have to define a database as serverless. So serverless, what it is? Well, first of all, we want to have that our database is highly available and because if it's not, if I have to do myself a failover from a master to a slave, it's hardly, it's hardly something I would call serverless. Of course, there should be no server maintenance. Yes, of course, there's a server running behind the database, but if I have to go log in, do an SSH and uh, patch the operating system, well, it's hardly a serverless approach. But most importantly, I, most importantly, I want to be charged for what I use. What do I mean by that? I mean that usually there are two main components when you pay for a database on the cloud are computing and storage. Of course, if you store some data on a database, you expect to pay for it because you're using it. But if you don't perform any query, if you don't access the database in a serverless approach, you expect not to pay for it. You don't expect to pay the computing part of it. And as well, <coughs> sorry, most importantly, I want to have some form of continuous scaling. What do we mean by that? I mean that as a user of the database, as the application connecting to the database, I expect that the database scales, scales up and down and these scaling points are entirely transparent to the end user. So more resources are available when there are more requests and less resources are available when there are less requests. Wait, with that approach, with those four points, you might say there are already many databases out there, many services that fulfill those requirements. So they might be called serverless database. Think about PhoneDB, that is a transactional one, and is global, but uh, it's not SQL. Or Data Lake in the Microsoft Word is a serverless database. Oh, when you think about Google, well, Google Cloud Store, or Firebase as well, as a concept, they are serverless. They fulfill those requirements. And even if you stick to AWS, DynamoDB has been around for many years. And is that serverless? Well, with the latest functionality, the ability to scale capacity up and down automatically, well, it's serverless as well. So, why is there so much focus in the last couple of years about serverless databases thinking mainly about relational databases? Well, usually when you think about a relational database, you think at your relational database as your bottleneck. You have your nice application, your nice e-commerce site, your nice whatever you use that scales quite linearly and horizontally. You can easily add more nodes, you can add make your cluster bigger, you can use Kubernetes, you can use whatever you want. But often your bottleneck, your, the part that is really hard to scale up and down is the data layer. It's the relational database that reaches a point, reaches a point that is really, really hard to scale. And as a developer, as a developer, as a DBA, as an operational guy or manager or whatever, you want to be lazy, you want to have nothing to do with the complexity running behind. Ideally, in an ideal world, I want to run my e-commerce and scale my application and the database scales accordingly. And uh, 
is serverless in a way that I don't have to think too much about provisioning my self capacity and I can scale it up and rely that if when I need it is there for me and when I don't need it I don't have to pay for it and when I say lazy lazy is not a bad word I mean I really love this quote from Bill Gates I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it so Going back to our relational databases, how we are we going to do it in a way that uh, is, uh, is an easy way to use them? Well, maybe serverless is the way. And, but the key point why we focus so much about uh, relational databases is that, well, we don't want to, we want to use what we have. Uh, maybe your application is already relying on a MySQL server or a Postgres one. And you don't want to, yeah, it's wonderful that out there there are some serverless options, but you don't want to reinvent everything, redesign everything, change the knowledge that your development team has, change maybe the strength that the development team has, or the use case that requires some relational databases. You might want to reuse what you have, connect to the database the same way you were connecting before. Maybe you are building an application in Java, you are using a JDBC driver, well, you would like to ideally have a serverless backend, serverless data storage, and still be able to keep what you have. But the real main reason is that it's very easy to migrate, uh, relatively easy to migrate a front-end or migrate a web application to a new technology, whatever you go to container or whatever, you do something else, you do serverless or whatever, but it's pretty hard to do it at the data layer. Usually there are many data, there are a lot of data involved, there are a lot of complexity, a lot of old information stored there that is still vital for your business and you cannot simply throw away. I mean, I really love that post, that tweet from Andy Jesse, that is the CEO of um, AWS, because that was just about one and a half year ago, at the end, beginning of November 2018, where he basically very proudly said that by the end of 2018, so. Amazon will have 88% of their Oracle database and 97% of their critical database move to Aurora and Dynamo. And think that Amazon, and to me that gives, gives me the idea of what the complexity behind that is. If you think that Amazon has basically virtually unlimited resources and getting rid of Oracle and kicking Oracle is one of the main goals, think that it took them years to reach that point. 88% and they hadn't, they hadn't done it yet. Actually, one year later, in middle of October, just a few months ago, they finally say that, well, basically they got out of Oracle. So if you take a company like Amazon years, many years to get out of Oracle to move to their own database, you see why there's really a lot of focus on keeping the technology you have in terms of um, language and features and technical knowledge. So yes, you can, of course, you can run your MySQL in your own data center and decide to don't go serverless or go serverless with an entire different platform, but there's a lot more to do than simply just changing the engine. So, okay, we want to have a relational database. We want to use our SQL uh, language as we have used till now. So what do we want to have to really say we are serverless? Well, ideally, we would like to have a database cluster that uh, automatically starts up, scales, shuts down when we need that it shuts down, and uh, almost all it scales up and down based on the application uh, that I'm running. Well, that usually doesn't fit that well with a relational database. If you think about relational database, if you think about installing your database in your own data center, there are certain problems that you have to face quite often. First of all, connection limits. If you think about when you install a database, you have to think, oh, well, how many max connections I want to have in my MySQL? Uh, 1,000, 2,000, how many do I need? What's the size of the memory? How much memory this machine has? There are a few things to configure. Networking, I mean, the machine you have might be amazing, but at the end of the day, the more nodes you add in front, the more uh, you're able to scale out your uh, applications, you might reach a point that the bottleneck is the networking. You have as well provisioning issues. What do I mean by provisioning issues? Well, when I start my database, I have to decide 
how much CPU, how much memory, and also how much storage do I have to provision for this database? Do I have to use the numbers that I got from the sales team, so put in the petabyte of data, or should I be much more conservative and have to then scale that one up according to users, but have a lot of effort, a lot of operational work to do? I might even have some scaling issue in the sense that I have to decide I'm going to provision my database for peak time or am I going to find some kind of logic that uh, as well the um, capacity changes according to the time of the day or the time of the week. And as well at some point if I'm doing some develop I might want to introduce some Terraform or whatever else I'm going to use and in be able to make my database part of my infrastructure and usually a database is not the most the easiest part to, to integrate. Let's see what you can do for example on AWS the largest provider when you use MySQL but the same actually applies really to Postgres they are the same scenario and the same services are available so and see which basic option you have we are going to see that there are four different options and we're going to check which one satisfies our serverless requirement. Well, the very first way you can deploy a database, you can use a virtual machine, you can do everything yourself. You deploy your MySQL, the, probably the community edition, you can choose the version you want. You're probably going to use just a virtual machine with some storage, EBS, probably you're going to do some RAID because you need it. And the main advantage here, you have full control, your root of your database, you have as much flexibility as you want, you can change whatever you want. And there's a bit of vertical scaling in the sense that if you use a virtual machine, you can easily change the instance type or instance class even and decide that you're going to have double memory if you need it. But uh, you still have to, to do some downtime to do it. It's not that straightforward. You have to decide upfront how you're going to manage the storage and you have to set up as well your own replication how you're going to do it. You can decide to do it asynchronously, you can do it synchronous. You have to decide what you're going to do. It's the old way, traditional way, the one that probably fits better for a DBA that has really good knowledge of the technology used. Of course, there's no backup of failover out happening automatically. You have to manage that as well. So when, you, when something goes wrong and you want to fail over from the master to the slave or to, from master to master or so whatever, you have to do it yourself, decide how you're going to do it and decide how you're going to backup your data. I would say as well that this one is the only option you have. You have some specific requirement or specific flavor you want to use. So if you want to, for example, you start for your MySQL, you want to use Percona. Well, that's the only option you have, or layer cards or whatever. That's what you have. Here, the focus is if you use a virtual machine, it's pure flexibility. And of our four requirements, we had to say serverless. None of them is there, of course. So easy. Option number two is the very well known, it's been around for 10 years now, RDS with many features that have been added in many years. So it's a managed service. Amazon managed the service for you. Amazon managed the database for you. You have no access anymore to the operating system running behind. There's some vertical scaling again, maybe made easy because you can use a multi-AZ. There's some synchronous replication built by Amazon for you that is not anymore the open source one. There's some, it's done at the storage layer. There's some backup and point in time recovery feature built for you that are cool and very useful, make the life of um, the operational team much easier. You can go back in time to the point you need, create a new server at that point, use some automatic daily backups. There are some other features built on top of it like uh, monitoring, like performance inside that let you figure out what is going well and what is not going so well with your database. So for example, you might find out which queries are particularly badly affecting your database, which index maybe is missing. and so on. And this as well now, quite some recently, the ability to auto scale your storage, that means you still pre-allocate and say how much storage you want to have, but you can say instead of running out of storage, please add more storage when you, when you go below a certain threshold. That still is not a transparent operation, there's still some um, relative minor performances when that happens, so it's not really something that is transparent and easy scaling. So, the focus here is on uh, not anymore flexibility, it's a managed service, you cannot change everything you want, but you have at least to be generous, you can say you get two out of four of those requirements, you might say is up to a point highly available, and you can say that, yeah, probably, maybe uh, you don't have anymore the concept of server to patch yourself, so okay, let's say two out of four, but definitely you don't have a uh, 
cost point that you don't pay if you still have to provision it. So if you, you, if you don't perform any query, you still pay for it. And as well, it doesn't scale automatically for you in any way. You can add if you want to scale out some read replica, but you still have to do it and manage them yourself. So third option we have is uh, Aurora, our, the provision Aurora that has been now out for about five years and is built for the cloud, fully managed. It's the main product that Amazon has been pushing in the database world from their side to fight their battle with almost Oracle. It's an enterprise product. You're now switching from running MySQL for you to be MySQL compatible. Uh, there's some you can still perform yourself some vertical scaling, but it's still manual. You still decide which instance, which server, which capacity you want to have. Is Now the technology is not anymore an open source one, it's a fork. And there's some managed storage for you, so okay, step forward. You don't have to anymore allocate storage up front. You know that the storage is going to grow according to your usage. And uh, backup and uh, replication is now entirely transparent to you how they basically you know that is automatically your data is replicated in different data centers there are multiple copies you don't even care too much about the details you know that the data is there and is there for you and is safe enough backtrack so you have even the ability now to go back in time that means i introduced a very bad bug yesterday that dropped one table or whatever i'm able to go on the very same database server without turning on a new one, I can just go back, freeze my database and go back in time to that particular time. And now they introduce as well some multi-master feature. But if you think about our use case that we want to talk about serverless, it's an enterprise product and probably is a two, two plus out of four, but still in terms of cost, you're still paying for the instance running. So the instance is running. If you perform no query, you still pay for it. And uh, Definitely, there's no vertical scaling or no kind of scaling of resources done for you automatically. So if you want, you can turn on some read replica, standard MySQL replica or some Aurora replica, but still you have to manage them yourself. Nothing happens magically. So if you think about automation, well, there's still something to do to go serverless. And OK, you can say, I don't need to go serverless. I can do it myself. I can scale an instance vertically and achieve both of those requirements. OK, I will probably still pay a minimum if the database has no requests at all. But maybe I can go for the very small instance and maybe the storage is going to be my main component and they don't really care. Well, even to scale vertically an instance with Aurora or even with RDS is not that straightforward. OK, you can create a nice alarm and say, OK, if my CPU is above a certain threshold for a certain time or below a certain threshold for a certain time, please kick in a Lambda function and with that Lambda function, change the instance type. It's, well, it's feasible. It's, uh, you can do it, uh, of course, in different metrics. You can do it on the CPU, you can do it on the number of IOPS, uh, you can do it on latency, on the memory use the matrix you want and you can use it uh, the lambda function you can use the common line you can use the SDK but at the end of the day it's not it's not covering the requirement of a serverless database because even if you do it and you build the logic yourself it's still this kind of logic not transparent to the end user your scaling point are going to happen with a reboot of the instance because basically the the failover on RDS is basically a change in C name so there's going to be some downtime. There's going to be as well that the query running have been dropped. So it's not really okay. Your application might reconnect, but it's still not really a serverless database. There's no automatic scaling out of nothing. So why is it not really available out of the box? Well, because it basically will be an improvement, will be allow you to avoid to provision capacity just for peak time, but still it's not really serverless. And it's not serverless for at least a couple of reasons. First of all, when you perform the change, you're still freezing your instance to don't be able to modify any other parameter for the duration of the change. And as well, your data is not really, if you think about the, uh, in the B in MySQL, if you think about the buffer, memory, in general, your data is in memory, is warm, your database is performing a certain uh, capacity and suddenly you reboot the database, you fail over to a different one and suddenly your data is getting cold and it's going to take a bit of time before the database is performing as well as you want it. So there are not really operations that you want to do that often. 
Is there anything really that is serverless? Well, two years ago, Amazon introduced Aurora Serverless for MySQL, and just about a year ago, they introduced something called uh, uh, something similar for Postgres. First, of course, in beta, and then um, GA. And uh, Aurora Serverless is an uh, auto-scaling configuration. What do you mean by auto-scaling? Well, it's more or less doing what we were talking about before, but in a transparent way. So first of all, you're going to have a endpoint that is your database, your CNAME, but there's no instance size. You don't say anymore how much memory or computing power you want to have. Well, there are going to be a couple of points that uh, you might define a range of what they call ACU, that is um, how much basically range you are allow your database to scale up and down because you want maybe to avoid to spend too much that due to a bug or a specific a peak that you didn't expect your database goes through the roof but uh, for the rest is basically you are just saying this is my database and uh, the storage again you don't pre-provision it and there's some very easy vertical scaling you pay for what you use what do you mean by you pay for what you use you pay for the storage of course because the data is there so data is stored for you and you pay for that, but the capacity you pay just for when you use it. Plus a few minutes for the scale down and the shutdown and whatever, we'll see the details in a second. There are a few more restrictions compared to the previous version, to the uh, uh, provision or RDS, for example, is only compatible with still for 5.6. It's quite interesting to see that they're actually not going for the latest version. They are going still for the version that are the most probably popular or deployed in their cloud. That's the best guess I can have. It's a technology that is less than two years old with many iterations in it. So a few of the features are actually much newer than two years. Key point is what we said at the beginning, we are able to use MySQL TCP connection. We can use as well data API connection. We see that in a second. But key point here is what we said at the beginning. We are lazy. We want to use what we have. So if we were building an application in Java using a JDBC driver, we can use our JDBC driver to connect to our Aurora serverless. And that's really powerful. So what are the most obvious use cases you want to use it? Well, unpredictable load. Of course, if you have an application that you don't really know how it's going to scale, um, well, how it's going to be used or what's going to happen in the next few hours. Well, maybe that's really a good case. Uh, serverless application, because, uh, well, if you scale uh, the number of uh, requests in parallel from 1 to 10,000 as a serverless application, you might want that the data libraries uh, behave in the same way. Some development test feature, if it's compatible with your version, but uh, yeah, again, there are environments where maybe you're testing just for a few hours a day or a few moments or whatever. And in general, when you have some intermittent load, if the load is constant and stable during 24 hours in the week and they're quite standard and normal pattern, probably it's not the best use case. Maybe it makes no much sense money-wise. A word of warning here is I see often that people are comparing how much it costs to run this very smallest instance on RDS or Aurora with running um, a serverless database usually coming out with answer like, oh, if I use a micro instance on RDS, always running is cheaper than running uh, Aurora serverless. Well, that might be true, but you're missing the point. Here is we are talking about unpredictable load and we are talking about a database that is already highly available and there for you. So if your traffic suddenly scales, their database is going to scale. You don't have to do it yourself. So that's the main benefit out there. How does it really work? There's a nice presentation from when they, just over one year ago at reInvent 2018, so December 2018, that really shows in one hour how the um, entire engine works, what's the logic behind, how do, are they able to provide some warm pool for your data. I really suggest to go through it because it really helps you understand what are the use cases and how really take advantage of them. Aurora serverless database. Uh, but from a very high point of view, because at the end, the main point, I'm lazy, I don't want to really use, know too much about what's happening behind. I just want to know that it's there for me. Basically, your application are instead not talking directly to the database, are talking to a proxy. And uh, behind are running some work pool of database capacity. What does it mean, work pool? Is that the database is already one for you, the cache is already there, and uh, accessing the database storage. So. 
Uh, the advantage here is that uh, when uh, the capacity change, so uh, a bigger database server is running behind, that change is transparent to you as a user. Is that really super exciting? Well, we said for those cases, unpredictable load, weekly reporting, development test intermittent, are really good cases to test it and play with it. But, 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 before going through the problem, let's see as well that it's not AWS only. Let's say as well that, for example, Microsoft as well came up with uh, just a few months ago, less than one year ago now, with something similar. It's called SQL Database Serverless. Of course, it's not MySQL, it's SQL Server. And uh, the focus again is very much on the compute auto scaling, so on the price performance. And that's a cool thing as well. But the key point we have to understand is we say that the one main feature we want to have is that uh, the change in uh, the scaling is happening behind the scene and is entirely transparent to me, to me as a user, as a person performing the connection or the driver. Well, not dropping the connection is one of the key features that by default happens in, uh, in Aurora Serverless. There's a downside in that that is really important to understand. The ability, there, the ability to don't drop the connection means as well that how does that really work? There's no magic. I mean, basically, the data behind some logic is trying to find a scaling point. What does it mean, find a scaling point? Well, if you have a long running query or transaction in progress or temporary table or table lock in use, it might not happen. It might not happen at a scaling point. Why? Because it's, it's trying to preserve your connection. So you can change that behavior by default. You can say it might drop the connection, but you cannot have both. So either you're able to preserve the running connection, but that means that it might not scale if your connection lasts too long, or you might have to drop the connection to be able to perform a scaling. I will say that that's a key point to understand and always remember that your applications still need to be able to reconnect the database if that's the case. Well, you might say, okay, we have achieved uh, how to scale in Aurora. Is that really serverless? Well, probably for the first points we discussed before, yes. But still, for example, when you talk about a serverless application, the idea to connect to a JDBC using a JDBC driver or any TCP connection to using the the database protocol might be not the ideal world. Here comes the extra layer. The extra layer is that the database has as well a data API, Aurora Service Data API in this case, that is basically a way to access your database directly with a HTTP connection. So no JDBC driver anymore. So you think about, for example, a serverless application written in Lambda, might be a good way to approach it. Uh, the syntax is quite convoluted, but at the end of the day, you are still performing an execute statement. And of course, there's uh, some overhead here that uh, when you do the data request, you're opening and closing the connection. So it might fit certain scenario, it might not fit some other scenario. So the data API is not going to simply replace your uh, TCP connection. So what are the main issues we might want to, we might face when we play with um, serverless database. Well, first of all, we say it's 5.6. So it might be well to say it's perfect to do testing, to do application with intermittent load, whatever. But if your application require a MySQL 8 or 5.7 or whatever, it's still not there. I mean, it might come, it might come soon, it might come later, but as for today, it's not available. If you have, for example, a requirement to enable the auditing module that you're able to do on RDS. You cannot do it here. So that's another limitation. It's VPC only. What does it mean VPC only? It means that you cannot enable the endpoint from outside the AWS cloud. So for example, if it's a database that you need to access from outside, even just for reporting or whatever else, well, that doesn't really work out of the box. And uh, there's some delay, the entire concept of delaying and sleeping, the way it works is if you don't perform query for a certain amount of time, your database goes to sleep and to recover, it might take a few seconds, five seconds, 20 seconds or whatever. That for the very first query, uh, that might be okay for certain application. It might be entirely not okay for other ones. Yes, you can say, well, then I keep it always running. I can keep it running with the smallest amount of ECU, that is one, but still at that point is not really a 
pure serverless databases we defined it at the beginning. I will add other two major things to keep in mind is there are two <coughs> matrix that the database is using to scale up and down. And there's no magic there. The matrix are CPU usage and um, number of connections. Now, CPU usage is quite obvious. So, okay, if the database goes above a certain threshold, the database scales up. And uh, if it goes below a certain threshold, a certain amount for a certain amount of minutes, it scales down. Fine. Number of connection, you might be careful if, you, if your application is using pools and keeping connection open in the pool. So if you have a pool that has a minimum, maximum and number of active connection always there for you, like, I don't know, you define a fixed number of connection and you use this pool, well, it, may, it might be that your database is not scaling down even if nothing is really happening because the, the number of connection is still open. And uh, another one is you really need to think about what you usually need to change in the configuration of your database because basically, well, if you remember when we talk about running your own database in a virtual machine, you were able to basically change whatever you wanted. When you run um, a database in um, serverless, in RDS, you might be able to change most of the configuration of your database. Aurora, a bit less. In the serverless world, is almost nothing. So keep that in mind because that might be a bit of a limitation for certain use cases. So the focus here is really in being elastic and we could say that with many limitation, many constraints in the term of version, in the term of uh, minimum capacity, maximum capacity and so on, but we cover here the four requirements we defined in the beginning. There's a fifth one that you might wonder if it should apply, that usually doesn't apply to relational databases, the global endpoint. So be able to use a database without having to define which region, which data center you are really running it. So the case, for example, of FourNDB. But uh, when you really think about the main problem here is you need to keep in mind that you're still performing, as you could have done it automatically, a scale up. What do I mean by scale up is vertical. So you're going up and down with capacity, but that has a fee maximum number and is you cannot, it's not scaling out. So it's great for many use cases, but it's still very limited. So when you think about scaling out, that's a very different approach. There's nothing out of the box, either in Aurora serverless or either in the entire AWS ecosystem, there are things that might help you running a database, a relational database, a MySQL in this case, as a scale out, but you have to manage them yourself. So for example, can I do, can I split my read from my write and run many replicas? Yeah, up to a point, yes, there's a maximum number of read replica you can set up for RDS and Aurora, but you have to set them up and you have to manage them. Can I do certain sharding myself out of the box transparent? There's no sharding here. It's, I have to do it myself if I want to use it. Of course, the cloud is going to help me because I'm able to, to have as many resources, as many servers I want to have. But the managing is orthogonal as a problem. Basically, I, I have to manage it myself. The same as I just mentioned, distributed worldwide, that's not the case. Our servers is not covering that scenario. So, Yes, if you want to have an application that goes around the world and uh, can be accessed by data from around the world, well, there are easy ways in, uh, in Aurora serverless to immediately take a snapshot and create a new instance in a different region, but it's a new instance. So it's not a global endpoint. Here comes Amazon Northern Light, a managed Kubernetes MySQL cluster running on Vitesse. No, I'm just joking. There's nothing. That's the main, I will say the main down point of this is you really serve 90% of the customer with that approach and it's great, but it's vertical scaling. That keep it in mind. I would like to close with a quote from Peter from Percona that I really love. Is auto scaling can convert some performance bug to large bills because of course one of the problem or benefit of auto scaling is that you don't have voltage you don't have downtime but of course you pay for what you use so a bad bug introduced in your application can create a cluster of auto scaling instances that is much bigger than what you're usually having and that's bad but with databases it may even go worse in the sense that the bad query is often so bad that no auto scaling can make it tolerable 
And that means that, for example, you are a, a badly performing cron that performs a query that you do maybe for some statistics or some analysis, might run forever, push your Aurora serverless up to the maximum limit you define of ACU, and your database is going to crash anyway. With that one, thank you very much, and goodbye.